Hello, BookTube. A little while ago, Kieran at KD Books put out a list of the top 10 classics you must, all in caps, read. And such videos are irresistible. <laughs> They're catnip. You see them and you immediately want to respond. I did. Other people have. It'll get you thinking, even if you don't make a response video to it. And KD wasn't finished. He had two other videos in mind. He did then a top 10 modern classics that you must read being books from the 20th century ending on the last day of 1999. And when you saw that list, I made a response video to that as well. I'll try to leave a link to all of this stuff down below, but I'll at least leave a link to Katie's video, to Kieran's videos. When he had done those two lists, there was one remaining. <laughs> the one that is going to be the biggest head scratcher, the biggest argument starter. Because the one remaining list is the top 10 contemporary classics that you must, all in caps, read. And that is naturally perilous for reasons that I sort of took a stab at in my top 10 modern classics response video. Which is that the closer you get to the present moment, the more of the variables you use to determine what belongs on a list like this fall away. One of those variables, like it or not, is something like consensus. Not because 80 million Frenchmen can't be wrong. That consensus does not confer value. 50 years ago, there was a novel that was unbelievably popular in the UK and America that no one reads anymore. It's entirely out of print. And no one cares about it whatsoever. Yesterday, I talked about a couple of books that fit that description. In terms of a novel that everyone would remember, but that no one reads anymore, well... MMK's The Far Pavilions was a publishing phenomenon. Nobody reads that book anymore. It'll never be in print. It'll never be reprinted again. So consensus isn't everything. The reason why consensus is important in lists like this is because one of the things that Kieran is trying to measure is the effect that the books on his list have on other books. This is not solely a list of your favorite books that fit the category and the time period. It's also a list of influential books. And influence is an outgrowth of consensus in some way or other. A book, If a book is completely forgotten, falls between the cracks of the literary consciousness, it won't affect anything. And therefore it won't have that element in this, in this stew of estimation. That's one, is consensus. But there's another element involved in uh, assessing books for lists like this that is necessarily missing from a contemporary list, and that is time. Karen himself points out in his video that, that contemporary classics feels like an oxymoron. It feels like a, a contradiction in terms. The reason it feels that way is because it is that way. One of the elements that we use to determine whether or not something is a classic is certainly not who shouts the loudest on Twitter. Instead, it's whether or not it lasts. The z-axis, the fourth dimension, the dimension of time, the one thing that a contemporary book critic cannot estimate, either in a social dimension or in a personal dimension. When I read a book, I can tell you a lot about what works and doesn't work in it. I can tell you a lot about subjective impressions that you might have that I had, but I can't tell you what I'll think about it in five years. I can't tell you how much I'll have thought about it between now and five years from now, or two years from now. I can't tell you that element of time's passage because it hasn't happened yet, and neither can anyone else. So one, one other unguessable element on this list, an element that gets weaker the further in time you progress, is that element of uh, how much the book sticks with you, how much it unfolds inside you or inside you know, just a general readership, which means that the list that we're doing now, the top 10 contemporary classics that you must read, it's almost certainly going to have more failures and successes on it because <laughs> there's no way to say must, there's no way to say classic, there's no way to say influential with any of these things yet. We just have to wait for all of that. So the third list here in this triptych becomes much more a sense of favorites, but with one added element mixed in, a slight element of, in addition to me liking this book, I also think it might be important with a capital I. And uh, Kieran gives his list. <laughs> I knew that I was going to be in for trouble. Uh, I got more trouble than I bargained for. He starts off his list with uh, these waves of girls. Uh, 
uh, by Catherine Davis, which is a text. It's an internet text. And I haven't read it. I've heard about it. Occasionally, I have gone to uh, literary parties that were just insufferable enough so that people were talking about this thing. But I've never read it. I doubt that I ever would. In his video, Kieran mentions a few internet-based texts. And he mentions what you would your be your first objection. The first thing that will come to your mind is, well, if it's multimedia, if it's got hot links to all sorts of things, knowing the internet, half those things won't work anymore. And he very, very gamely addresses that by saying that the very meta phenomenon of internet links not working is part of the genius of these projects. <laughs> Pull the other one. It's got bells on it. It's not a complete text, if it isn't a complete text. But I wouldn't know because I haven't read it. The next book that he lists, though, his number two is, uh, or his number nine, is Persepolis by Marjane Satrapi, which is a, would be an instance that I strongly echo. It's, it, it's a graphic novel, but it is a genius work. It, you don't need to read more than 10 pages to know that. Who, whether or not it's long-standing influence, well, that's, like I said, a, a matter of guesswork. But in terms of that feeling of it being important with a capital I, it's unavoidable. I'm not going to put it on my list. I'm not, as far as I know, I'm only going to put one book on my list that KD had, that Kieran had on his list. Because there are so many choices. I, I really wanted to preserve my real estate. So I, I, I want to strongly second Persepolis, but I, I, won't, I won't put it on my list. And then the third, the third entry on his list was Falling Man by Don DeLillo which is Don DeLillo's 9-11 novel. And Kieran I, includes it, I think, in part, at least listening to his rationale, because you should include some reflection on 9-11 uh, on a list of 21st century books, because 9-11 was one of the most important events to happen so far in the 21st century. He also includes a, a pandemic book, as we'll see. I've mentioned on this channel, uh, I've mentioned on this channel a couple of times, I don't mean to alarm anybody, I don't want to be a, a doom and gloomer, but I, I think it's entirely possible that the 21st century has things, collective things, collective traumas or events in store that will make both the pandemic and 9-11 seem a little trivial, a little provincial. I think that's entirely likely. The last century definitely had that. <laughs> In the last century, in 1922, uh, Deb and I thought we had seen it all. And there were two world wars to come. <laughs> so so I, wouldn't, I wouldn't count out the 21st century is what I'm saying. I think the 20, for instance, just as an example, not to make this a litany of horrors, I think the 21st century will see uh, the almost complete collapse of the environment of the planet as we know it today. The idea, the prognostications that are being made by lots of experts that this will be a gradual thing that will take centuries, I think is completely wrong. I've looked at a lot of the underlying studies that they've looked at, and it looks to me like most of them describe events proceeding to the edge of a cliff in a very orderly and steadily predictable way. But what happens when you get past the edge of the cliff is no longer steady. <laughs> it's precipitate. And I think that's what's going to happen. I think probably sometime in the early 2030s, the climate is going to collapse. And by collapse, I mean no more drinkable water, heat storms everywhere, including in the, the northern regions of the planet, unlivable conditions, tens of millions of people migrating, hardly because of the climate. I, I, I would be willing to bet that that is one of the gigantic effects that the 21st century has to give that it hasn't given yet. So I didn't feel compelled to put anything 9-11 or COVID on my list. And I wouldn't put Falling Man on there anyway. <laughs> I, just, I thought it was kind of... Uh, Falling Man is... It's classic Don DeLillo. Don DeLillo only steps out of his own normal writing register a couple of times in his entire career. When he does, the results are wonderful. But he usually doesn't. I thought it was kind of funny that uh, Kieran describes Falling Man as nondescript and pallid. And almost seems to say in his description... That is somehow odd for Don DeLillo. Those are perfect descriptions of this writer, just in general, except for his exceptional work. So for a 9-11 book to be both unimportant and boring, when 9-11 was neither of those things, I don't know that I'd pick. <laughs> and if that's true, then his next pick, I certainly wouldn't pick. He picks The Interminable My Struggle by Carl Ovenoskart. And for some reason, 
he puts this on this list even though all the rest of the list is fiction. My struggle is not fiction. I don't care what the cover of the book says. The cover of the book is a few letters in the English language printed there by some guy at a print shop. <laughs> I don't care what the cover of the book says. He's been sued for the fact that every single word in these books is true, except for the way that he has distorted them in order to slander the living uh, by making himself the downtrodden, chain-smoking hero of his own story when he's the villain half the time. He's been sued by the people whose, whose living existence he has co-opted to this utterly boring mess of an ongoing fraud on the literary community. So what it's doing on a list that otherwise has only fiction, I don't know, but it doesn't belong there anyway, unless we're talking about influence. If that, I don't get that impression. I, I will, I will give Kieran a small out, but I don't think he'll take it. I think he likes this junk, but I think that's why it's on his list because he likes this junk. If he doesn't, it might still end up on the list because it certainly was influential. It opened the door for people who call themselves novelists to never write any fiction anymore. Why bother? Why bother putting up index cards on a corkboard so that I can keep track of the eye color of whatever character or what they said or what their own past experiences were? Why bother to do that when I can just write about myself? When I can just transcribe my own Facebook feed? Why bother to write fiction if I can do that and call it novel, call it a fiction? Uh, so it may be influential in that regard. <laughs> then the next item on Kieran's list is Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel, which he's, he had a, he, he's, he admits that it's great. It is great. The, the trilogy is just fantastic. It's harrowingly movable and amazingly adult. You are expected to, to pull your weight in reading these books. It does, they're, they're not like normal Tudor historical fiction that spoons feeds you every single precious little period detail. Instead, there are a lot of vital human realities involved in these stories that you just have to figure out on your own. You have, the author will take you only so far. It's assumed that you are a complex and nuanced enough human to figure out what's going on. And that is all true. I loved, I loved Kieran's offhand comment. He was trying to assess these books, not just rave about them. And he gave an offhand comment that everybody is called Thomas. <laughs> there were a lot of Thomases. There are a lot of Thomases in the story. It's true. But, <laughs> in her defense, Hilary Mantel manages to distinguish a lot of the Thomases so that it's not just Thomas after Thomas after Thomas. There are three main Thomases <laughs> in the in the course of the book, and only one of them is ever usually called that. So <laughs> anyway, it's a kind of a kind of a neat objection. I've never heard that before. Then his next book is Homestuck. And it's another book that is not a book. It is an internet artifact that is full of broken links. I've never read it any more than I've read These Waves of Girls. So, uh, oddly enough, Kieran's entry in the top ten contemporary classics you must read is actually his most successful to date entry in the Has Steve Read It Challenge. <laughs> uh, then his next book is The Q by Sabdal Aziz which I would not have encountered except for one of you. One of you strongly, strongly recommended it to me and sent me the ebook. Otherwise, I don't think, I don't think the Q has ever been published in America. If it has, it missed me completely. And I read it, thought it was very, very powerful. Not sure what I would do about putting it on a list like this. You'll find that my own list is far more mainstream <laughs> than, than Kieran's list, which makes these kinds of lists fascinating. Right? His list is is infinitely more interesting than mine. Mine will have a lot of things on it that you will be able to predict. <laughs> then uh, his next book is Let Them Eat Chaos uh, by Kay Tempest. Uh, but it's not a book. It's an album. Which is... I'm sure, I'm sure that KD, uh, that Kieran was trying to be transgressive and argument starting, but it really is the ultimate indictment of the 21st century in terms of literature. If you have only 10 spots on a list and you include an album, <laughs> I'm not in the slightest tempted to do that. <laughs> there are plenty of books, way too many. I can make a list of 100. So we'll pass right over that since it's not a book. Uh, we'll move on to his next one, which is The Orphanage by Serhi Zadan. Uh, which I haven't read. So he's doing really well for Has Steve Read It, but that was not his intent with this list. I haven't read it, can't speak to whether or not it's uh, it's any good. Certainly his description makes it sound very interesting, but I'm not sure that it was ever published in America. It's not ringing a bell with me if it was. And then his final one is uh, 
Just the Plague by Ludmila Ulitskaya. And it's, like I mentioned, it's he, he figured that it was probably a good idea to have a COVID book on this list. I would argue that the great COVID book hasn't been written yet, or that it is uh, Orhan Pamuk's new book. Not Ulitskaya, because yes, that's the subject, but the book is boring. The book is flatly written. Which, you know, uh, in, there's there are two elements involved in uh, in putting a list, a book on a list that reflects a major event of the time. One is that it reflects a major event of the time, and the other is how well it's done. You can't just reflect a major event of the time and show up and expect to be on a list like this, I don't think. And uh, so I wouldn't put this on the list. I, I don't know that I would do much in the way of contemporary signaling at all. But I do have I do have a list of my own. Uh, naturally, it wouldn't be a video like this on a list of my own. So I want to give you mine, and I don't think mine has as many head scratchers on it as Karen. Uh, probably my first one is the biggest one, and that's this, Perdido Street Station by China Mieville. This is fantasy slash science fiction. It's uh, an eerie, weird blend of the two, but also uh, kind of a, a signal that the standard, the literary standard for science fiction and fantasy in the 21st century should probably be higher than it was in the 20th century, even if it doesn't reach that standard. Because this is, this is notably artistic, as well as being, you know, cram cramped full of ideas, like you would expect fantasy or science fiction to be. It's also notably artistic. It's beautifully done. So it would be on my list, even though I am freely admit it's probably the weakest entry on this list. Then we'd have, um, like I said, my list will be mostly conventional. This uh, next entry is historical fiction done in a particular register, a particular frantic, over-egged register that is wonderful when it's done right, and lots of people have done it. This is The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay by Michael Chabon. It's kind of a loving tribute to Stanley and Jack Kirby, to two skinny Jewish kids who decided to create an entire imaginative scape, a landscape, and live in it and draw other people into it and, and work out their psychodramas on that landscape. I was impressed by this when it first came out, but I have grown more impressed with it as time has gone on. Every time I go back to it, I find that more has been packed into it than I originally saw. So this is an example of a book that's on my list because I strongly suspect that it is one of those books that will grow with time. I, I, it's only it's it's only twenty years old, so I, I don't know for sure. But I'd be willing to bet that this will be rewarding me for the rest of my life, which is that element. That is that unguessed time passage element. Same thing with this next one. This next one, frankly, did not impress me when I first read it when it first came out. But then more and more, it did. I've gone back to it a few times now. It's Gilead by Marilyn Robinson, probably one of our greatest living writers. This is at, uh, on a surface a very simple story, just a very humble, quiet framework for a story about an, old, an older man writing letters, but it, writing letters in small town Iowa. But it it really really works. It 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 is that small you know two inch width of ivory that Jane Austen talked about for her own novels, done for a new century done in the exact same way. Let me see how many elementary, elementary things I can find in such a small scale, on, in such a quiet register. Uh, and when we're talking about quiet registers in fiction, we are not talking about our next book, which is A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara. I read uh, this author's first book and thought, oh, that's, that's pretty interesting. It, it, the, her first book was heavily pushed by the bookstore chain Barnes & Noble. It was a BNN Discovery title, which meant a lot for the for the, the author. It meant a significant payday for the author and a significant presence in every bookstore, every Barnes and Noble in the country, which meant a lot. But it, nothing in that book prepared me for what what I would get in this book. What everybody else gets in this book. This is, uh, this is the twenty first century iteration of Thomas Hardy. This is misery, over and over and over and over again. And you are just. Uh, determined, you are challenged by the author to find beauty in that. The beauty will not come from the lifting of the misery. You will have to find the beauty in the misery. And it's tremendously impressive. It's just tr a tremendously impressive job. 
I, whether or not it's influential with a capital I, I don't really know. But uh, I'm going to include next a book that I think was itself a product of influence and is certainly going to be influenced, uh, influential on other books. By far the most recent book on my list, this is M, Son of the Century by Antonio Scarati. This is the English language translation by Anne Milano Appel. But I can I can say, I can, I can testify that the translation, as wonderful as it is, it really does justice to the electricity of the original. This is an amazing book. It's an amazing kind of historical fiction telling the intellectual and personal manhood formation of Italian, the Italian fascist dictator Benito Mussolini. So this is not a World War II novel, it, and yet it's unbelievably gripping. I, I don't quite know how to explain the power that it has, especially in light of the fact that the description of the book doesn't make it sound like me. I would I would forgive you completely if you heard my description and said, oh, that's not for me. I'm glad you liked it, but it's not for me. Take my word for it. It's for you. Whether you thought you would ever be interested in a novel about this subject or not, it is all about the execution. And oh my. <laughs> well, I, I, my, I strongly, strongly recommend this. Even the English language translation is a marvel. So even in the English language translation, I strongly, strongly recommend it. You will see, I believe, what I'm talking about. And the reason I said it was influential because it takes uh, all the armament of high drama and invests that internally in the, in the internal reality of a loathsome individual. Not with the intent to make that individual sympathetic. You do not, at the end of, of this novel, which is the first in a trilogy, you do not like Benito Mussolini. But you have lived inside his skin. You cannot deny him even a single inch of his humanity, even though you don't like him. That, I think, will be tremendously influential. I don't think it'll be long before we see someone attempt that with much worse figures in history than Mussolini. Whether or not it should be attempted and whether or not it succeeds, I don't know. Uh, the only example like this that I had seen really beforehand in full dress was a particular short story by Martin Amos about the 9-11 suicide bomber, Mohammed Atta. That was only a story. The M is a long novel and works. And that's why I think it will be influential, because people will look at it and think, I could probably do this for some other horrible figure in history. And the reason why I say that it was heavily influenced is because a major book in recent memory did that to huge international success. And this will be an explicit echo of Kieran at KD Books. I like it when these lists explicitly echo at least one choice. And that echo is Wolf Hall by Hilary Mantel, which isn't quite as immediate as Benito Mussolini, but she does that. She goes into her main character, Thomas Cromwell, a jumped-up lawyer that Henry used to do a lot of mean and evil things, and who was himself a mean and evil person. You only have to look at his portrait by Hans Holbein to know that. Uh, Hilary Mantel goes at this figure and decides to make him a proto-social justice saint. A, an almost totally likable, almost totally nice, almost totally right with a capital R figure. She has mastered all of the documentation that says that Cromwell was not that. But she takes you inside him, inside his thoughts, inside his feelings, to the point where you certainly know that he was human. Whether or not you believe her portrait or, or history, you know that he was human. It works in a way that, again, like with M, Son of the Century, so too with Wolf Hall, if you haven't read it, it's going to be hard for me to explain the effect that it has, but it is amazing. It is, And in both cases, that effect is only one thing. The main thing in both these cases is how beautifully it's written, how wonderful a reading experience it is. But it will also have an effect. Uh, oh, oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, there's the beam. Uh, so Wolf Hall is on my list, just like it was on Kieran's list. Then this next one, we will do a debut. Uh, this was came out in the year 2000, and it sort of passed me by. I thought it was pretty damn impressive, but not anything much. But then I have been thinking about it. I have kept thinking about it and kept returning to it. 
to the point where I am going to put it on this list in preference to lots of bigger books uh, in the metaphorical sense that I loved a lot more. I'm going to put it on this list because I think it probably is important with a capital I, influential with a capital I, and that is White Teeth by Zadie Smith. An unbelievably uh, multifaceted, energetic, immigration experience novel. It's bursting at the seams. It f really does feel like the kind of book that a, a debut author, we've seen them on this channel, we've talked about them for years, the kind of debut a book that totally exhausts its author. And we never hear from them again. <laughs> it really did feel like it didn't end up being true with Zadie Smith. And I'm glad about that because a lot of the books that she's written since have been really good. It, this didn't turn out to be true, but it feels that way. It feels like I'm going to throw everything at this and that's it. Uh, that's all I have. And that feeling, I'm going to throw everything at this, is very much present in our next book. Also fairly recent, 2019. But I believe influential with a capital I and also a, a kind of a signpost book for the new century, something that you must, all in caps, read. And that is Duck's Newbery Report by Lucy Elman. Uh, weird, strange, I believe the highfalutin literary term would be maximalist. Novel about nothing. Novel about quotidia. But where the immensity, the sheer prolixity, is part of what's going on thematically in the book. Part of the kind of unmedicated obsessiveness that guides the whole book and fills it with whatever strange energy it has. <laughs> Considering how much I have thought about this book and how few answers I have about it. I'm going to say it belongs on this list. And then the next book, I have all the answers about the next book. I know everything there is to know about it. And the more I've thought about it, the more I've read it, the more I've been struck by its sheer raging power. It is, in my opinion, the most powerful book on this list and one of a handful of the most powerful books ever written in the 21st century so far. And it's volume two. <laughs> it's, it, you don't need to read volume one to read volume two. This is The American People, The Brutality of Fact by Larry Kramer, the late Larry Kramer. That is our author on the cover. And this is volume two of, he wrote two big fat books called The American People. And volume two, volume one is the history of the United States, but uh, dragged, kicking and screaming out of the closet. It's the, the, the kind of incandescently scandalous gay history of the United States that only Larry Kramer could write. But volume two is very different. Volume one is often hilarious and dark and bitter and angry, but br the brutality of fact is entirely different. It is contemporary history. It's Larry Kramer's own life. And it's long and unrelenting. It never lets you look away. It never lets you blink. It never gives you any comfort as it deals almost exclusively with the AIDS epidemic. It's by far the most powerful depiction of the AIDS epidemic in fiction or nonfiction that I've ever read, and I believe I've read most of them. But it's more than that. This this is... I, I do for a reread. I will reread it in uh, both volumes in 2023. Uh, but... It's more than just a searing portrait of the AIDS epidemic, of the AIDS era. It's also a, a, just a gigantic bawling yell out into the ether of a mind that did not want to die, of a mind that, a body that was in pain, a mind that was, that was angry and disillusioned, but a, a living creative force that did not want to go, just... I'm not doing a good job of explaining it, but this is an overwhelmingly powerful book. I don't know how influential it will be. And there were times when I was reading it, and then when I read I got the advanced copy and I read that. And I had to sit just quietly for a while when I finished reading it the first time. Then I read it the second time because I had to review it. And uh, there were times when I was reading it the second time when I was thinking, uh, this might be it. This might be the capstone book on an entire era of being gay in the world, and especially in America, and especially in New York. This might be the final word on such a subject as the subject moves on into a new century and no longer has to deal with the 1980s. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I had to put this on this list. When I was looking at uh, candidates, I had to put it on the list. But it's not number one. 
Number one the, is the only book on the list that is actually ranked is number one. Number one on my list is what I consider to be the most important work of fiction in the new century. Uh, and it's this. It's The Last the Last Samurai by Helen DeWitt. The story of a single mother and her boy who is a weird child prodigy. And they're making their way in the world. What happens to them as they make their way in the world? Which is a, a fairly good story on its own, but the it's the writing here. It's the gigantic, the way this book crams an entire universe into its covers it's the writing that is the, the that is the key here to why this is number one on my list. It's the execution, as it is in almost everything that I recommend. Uh, I have been waiting patiently for a book like this to appear in the 21st century. This appeared right at the beginning of the 20th century, of the 21st century. I've been waiting patiently for other books like this to appear. And some of the books on this list have been like it in some ways, but not entirely. Not entirely. I had hopes that The Goldfinch by Donna Tart would be such a book. But the more I went back to reread it just recently, and it has seams, it has cracks. There are things I didn't notice the first time that lessen my estimate. Whereas every time I go back to this thing, <laughs> the exact opposite happens. I cannot recommend this strongly enough. And that that is it. That is my top ten contemporary classics you must read. <laughs> Mine is far more conventional. Than Kieran's, I do not have any pop albums on here. I don't have any Broken Link internet artifacts on here. I don't have House of Leaves or whatever else, whatever kind of garbage you want to put on here. Instead, a fairly conventional list of full-dress novels. No nonfiction, like Carl over Nosgaard, just uh, novels that belong on your list. If you haven't put them there, I would strongly recommend that you do. <laughs> but I can't wait to see what other lists people come up with, because... Top 10 classics, okay, that's that's going to tell me, when you make that list, you're, that's going to tell me what you learned in school or where your tastes lie. But we already know what the classics are. You can pick and choose from them, but you can't find one. Top 10 modern classics, that's going to be largely the same, 80% the same. We, you can't find a modern classic. You you can pick and choose. You can move the chairs around. And some of your choices might surprise me, but you can't pull one out of nowhere. The the it, the period, the time is over. The, the element, the, the Z-axis element of people using time to consider the long-term effects of these works has already begun. It's long underway. But contemporary classics? <laughs> contemporary classics, that percentage shrinks down to almost nothing. Who's to say? Time will say. Critical consensus will say. Popular consensus will say, at least for a little while. Influences will say, and they haven't happened yet. So these, this list, in a way, is more interesting to me than, than either of the other two. Certainly Karen's version of it was, and I can't wait. I'm hoping that a lot of you do. <laughs> I'm hoping that a lot of you do this list. A lot of you may, be, may have been dissuaded from doing the previous two lists because maybe there are holes in your own personal reading. In the 21st century, I bet you've read a lot of 21st century stuff. I'm hoping lots of people do it. I will leave a link to as many of the earlier videos as I can think of, mine and Karen's, uh, and we'll see, what, we'll see what you think <laughs> of all of these classics pulled out of nowhere i think a lot of the ones on my list have a better chance of being read in 50 years than a lot of the ones on kieran's list we'll both make videos in 50 years and tally up our results <laughs> thank you booktube